Am I on yet? How are we doing, Faith? Good. Uh, you are still beautiful. I, I, in July, on the 1st of July, you were beautiful, and you still are. It's wonderful. <clears throat> um, wow, if you, look, if, you look, if you look this happy at the hour and a half point my message, you'll, that'll be a tremendous <laughs> blessing, I tell you. <clears throat> what if there was a silver bullet for the stress anxiety, and, inner and the inner turmoil that we experience in life, a silver bullet that does not include medication. And I think if you listen carefully to this message, the Holy Spirit will imprint upon your mind and heart a practical secret that has power to relieve you of a whole lot of the worthy and bother that you carry. This strategy has the potential to release streams of Christ's peace into your soul. And trust me when I say, <clears throat> when the Lord gave me this word, this was as much or more for me as it is for any of you. Now, <clears throat> And by the way, at the same time, this strategy that I'm going to share uh, as we go on is effective in opening the floodgates of the peace that we all should be carrying Amen. as his children. Now, as you know, fear is the opposite of faith. In fact, Jesus told a man plainly, do not be afraid. Just believe. That is why the most repeated command in all of Scripture is do not be afraid, or if you're a King James person, fear not. <laughs> in fact, that command appears in the Bible, some say, 365 times. I didn't count. But if that is so, that is one time for every day of the year. Fear and turmoil are used by the enemy of our souls to keep us from an ongoing experience of the peace of God. And if Satan can steal our joy and peace, he can just do major damage in our lives and keep us from bringing wreck to the kingdom of darkness. Both inner turmoil and fear can be paralyzing. Now on the night before Jesus died, he said this, Peace, peace I leave with you. Let not your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. In fact, actually he said let it not be afraid. And I think that that verse, 1427 of John, I think it is dynamite. Amen. I really believe that. Number one, because the Lord promises to gift us with an unworldly, a supernatural peace that passes understanding. Now, and secondly, the second thing is, is Jesus says that we are in control. He says, you do not let your heart be troubled. He says, you do not be afraid. Let it not be afraid. So, you may think to yourself, well, I'm not a very peaceful person. You may say, I'm glad Jesus promised that supernatural peace. But I'd like to know when he's going to follow through with that. And that's a little bit about what we're about here this morning. Now here's something I think all of us in this room probably know. You cannot be a born-again child of God, one who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, without having the Holy Spirit present inside your body somewhere. You can't have it. It can't happen. In fact, the Holy Spirit is resident within us all. We all carry him. 
And besides forgiveness and eternal life, the Holy Spirit is absolutely the greatest gift. It is the greatest gift that the, Jesus bestows upon all of us who have been born again from above. And just like, remember, those old baby on board signs that we used to keep seeing jiggling in the rear windows of the cars of the mothers. We all could wear a sign around our necks that says, Holy Spirit on board. And that'd be exactly right. Now, the Holy Spirit, in fact, is resident in the life of every believer. But equally true is the fact the Holy Spirit is not president of the life of every believer. The Holy Spirit wants preeminence in all of our choices and decision making. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes to us with gifts and with fruit. And in the culture of most Spirit-filled churches, the fruit of the Spirit does not receive as much airtime as the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul clearly tells us in 522 of the book of Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And six other things as well. And peace is number three, right after love and joy. My friends, every one of us has on deposit in the deepest part of our being. And that would, of course, be our redeemed human spirit. Each of us has within us, as a permanent possession... The fruit of the Spirit, the peace of Christ. Like the old chorus says, I have the peace that passes understanding way down in the depths of my heart. Do you remember? The reason we don't feel peaceful sometimes is that many times we don't know either how to or we fail to access and appropriate that peace from our spirit when we need it most. For example, the greatest challenge to our inner peace is when the life of someone we love is threatened. And sometimes we don't know how to draw upon the reservoir of God's peace so it flows into our mind and into our emotions. And so reading the prayer request this week, as, I sure, as I'm sure many of you, all of you have as well, those of you who are on the list to receive them. There, ha there have been those in our family who have experienced that exact challenge this week of knowing that the lives of those someone they love is threatened. Now, I have two questions. How many of you would say that you ever have or currently are navigating difficulties in your family relations, either immediate or extended. Could I see some hands? Thank you so much. Thank you for that. You know, I can't explain why, but Deb and I have been blessed for our families on both sides to just be pretty absent of drama across the years. And uh, I don't know why, but it's just the way it is, Ben, in our family. But, but I want to say that I, having pastored for a long, long time, I have witnessed a whole lot of difficulties with people who are managing family conflict of different kinds. And the second question is this. How many of you this morning would say that you experience some level of stress on the job where you work? Either, there they go, either, <laughs> and, what, and I meant stress not only that's inherent with the job, I'm talking about stress because of management and co-workers. Could I see some hands again? A lot of that. This is Labor Day weekend. Did you know that? 
Now, some of you know that my bride has been a labor and delivery RN for more than a quarter of a century. She's caught a lot of babies. And she used to say, on this weekend, every day, or I'm sorry, I blew it. Where, she used to say, where I work, every day is Labor Day. That's what she used to say. <laughs> now, this is, <clears throat> this is the holiday in our country where the dignity of work is recognized. Jesus recognized that dignity as well. Several of his parables talk about the work of laborers. He even speaks of workers in his spiritual kingdom. In fact, he says the opportunity to win souls is large. It's huge. But the laborers are few. He also said in 9.4 of John, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. The apostle says that we, you and I, each one of us, are God's co-workers. Think of the honor. Think of the responsibility. That implies that God is at work with us and we are at work with God. And Jesus verified that. He said, my father is always at work to this very day. And I too am working. My food, he said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And in his, pray to the, and in his prayer to his father on the night before he died, Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And may that be the prayer that we all can pray at the end of our lives. So in God's plan and His will, work is a good thing. And in our nation, we admire a strong work ethic. We honor people who work hard, whatever they do if it's honorable. But conversely, People who shun work and are lazy are looked down upon. We read this in Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 3. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working to the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Now in the New Testament, work is seen almost as an act of worship. It really is. We are to labor as if Jesus Christ himself was our supervisor. One day the pastor asked John, if Jesus Christ himself were your employer, would you work any differently? I sure would, exclaimed John. I'd work a lot harder. I think the point is clear. If people in your workplace know where you stand with the Lord, God is honored and Jesus is magnified. And, 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 and they are magnified by seeing your quality workmanship. Really are. But whether we are working for a living or working to build God's kingdom, human beings get tired. Notice? Fatigued. White. Spent. Worn out, exhausted, hard work, plus troubles and grief and pain take their toll. They really do. And that takes us to the heart of this message. And the heart of this message is about rest. 
Even though God's resources, even though God the Father's resources are never diminished, we read these familiar words in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God had finished his work, the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested. He rested from his work on the seventh day. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because, because on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. Now why did God set aside one day as a day of rest? Well, first of all, because we needed it. He knew that. And because, and while work is honorable, God did not want us to become workaholics. He really did not. In fact, he didn't want us to be completely spent at any time. He wanted us to have enough energy to get to know him and to set aside a day of worship and replenishing rest to enjoy our families and other things. That's why when I was pastoring, I used to say that my Sunday afternoon nap may have been the holiest thing I did all week long, <laughs> quite honest. But the truth, the truth were really known. More people know how to work well and they know how to rest well. And sometimes, sometimes people try to rest, and it's great. They take time away, and a change of scenery is definitely helpful. They take extended time that they spend with their families, and that's a wonderful diversion from work. Time with hobbies and fun activities, they're important. And vacation can seem like fresh air from heaven if we're not left more exhausted when we get home than before we left. But for many, for many, periodic, regular, deep, redeeming, restorative rest is a hard target to hit. And why is that? Because many are only looking for a resting place from work rather than, and listen, rather than a lifestyle of inner rest 24-7 even while you are working. Now, God said through the prophet Isaiah in 3015, he said this, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And the psalmist quotes the Lord in 46, be still, God said, be still and know that I am God. Now because Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time, he got tired. There are several occasions in scripture where we can see Jesus at rest. We know that he got away for some prayer retreats up in the mountains from time to time. One time he was so wiped that he fell asleep in the second deck of a boat while it was tossing like a cork on the lake during a storm. But another time I want to share with you is recorded by Mark in chapter 6. The apostles, it says, gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have time to eat. Jesus said to them, this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, 
come away with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Amen. Isn't that a good word? Jesus said so. The reason I say that, that is because we, we live in a country that sometimes when people see you really resting well, they think you're lazy. Or, and then we get this idea, well, I don't know, man, should I really be, I mean, there's so much to do, should I really be taking a moment? But it is a special and important thing to do so. So how to rest well. First of all, let us understand Every one of us who has been truly born again, every one of us has residing within us an organic unity with Christ, let me just say. 1 Corinthians 6.17 it is, he who, uh, but well, it's different, different translations. Oh, well, there we go, there we go. Whoever is joined to the Lord or whoever is united to the Lord is one with him yes. in spirit. Think of it. In the deepest part of our soul, not in our soul, but in our personhood, even below our soul, in our human spirit, there's a unity, there's an organic unity with Christ. And, and, and then we read over in Ephesians 2, 6, God raised us up with Christ. Notice past tense, not God will, past tense. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. So... Whether you know it or not, in your spirit, you're in two places at once. <laughs> you're sitting with him and you're enjoying worship at Life of Love. That's the way it is. And then, in 1423, Jesus said, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. And they, and, excuse me, my father will love them, and we, my father and I, we will come to them and make our home with them. And so, the scripture reveals that the presence of Christ and God the Father are united and organically linked to our human spirit. They are here, within us. Just like it says, the kingdom is within you. The king and the prince are with you too and inside you. In 1420, Jesus said, on that day you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. In 14, well, I actually... Uh, yeah, 14, 17 of John and also 16. But in 14 of John, I think it was already read this morning or mentioned in, in um, somewhere. We read this, the world cannot accept the Holy Spirit. I think that was Randy. <laughs> this, because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, the Holy Spirit, for he will be with you and will be in you. So the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are organically united to our human spirit. Even though we may not be able to touch that or feel that with our senses and the realization of our soul man and our, of our mind and our will and so forth. And Colossians 3, 1, and 3, 1 through 3 is a wonderful passage. Paul says, since then you have been raised with Christ. We talked about that in seed in the heavenly places. Since, then, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, where you are. And then he said this, verse 3. For you died. You know how we talk about the, the symbolic, the, the death that comes. We have this t-shirt that says, Die well from Todd. You know, that talks about the death with Christ. We are buried with Christ in baptism and so on. 
For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Yeah, I want to say, that's security. That is security to know that your life is hidden with Christ in God. I tell you what, that, that makes like the security Fort Knox like a piggy bank. <laughs> that is secure. We need to rest in that. We just need to rest in that. So many people are trying to earn what they have already been given by the blood of Christ. And we need to just take a rest and relax in that, in that assurance. <clears throat> so, sometimes we think about, we, then we have this wonderful verse from, from, from Psalms 91.1. And now we're really getting down to the crux of the end of this message. Whoever dwells in the shelter or the secret place, if we got 91.1, let's look at that. I think, in the King, I think in the New King James Version, it's the secret place, but I'm not sure. But uh, the New International says, uh, it uses the word shelter. But anyway, the King James, I think, says, whoever dwells in the secret place of the Most High will rest rest in the shelter of the Almighty. And so Jesus, remember that, remember that passage that Jesus said, when you pray, when you pray, go into your room and close the door and, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what is the secret place? I wondered for a while. I really, I thought about this for a long time. What real, how would you really define the secret place? And here's what the secret place is. This is Steve's definition. It's not in the Bible. The secret place is that eternal calm below the surface of your conscious being where Jesus abides it's in your spirit. It really is. And here's the and here and, and here we go. Here is the if I if I don't believe I've talked a long time and you may be half gone, but you can come back right now for this part. <laughs> here, here is the silver bullet remedy for stress, anxiety, and inner turmoil. It's learning. To live and work while resting in the secret place. That's it. Turning inward, not upward. So many people think that, they talk about their prayers not getting through the ceiling. Your prayers don't have to go through the ceiling. We don't try, we don't try to reach up to God. We, we, we re look into, we, we reach down into our spirit, into the depths of where he is. And we learn to abide. We learn to live there and abide with Christ in that way in our prayer life. We are already seated with him in heavenly realms. It's about having that conversation from this side is what it's about. That's what prayer really is. And that's just reaching down inside. Um, now, the, proud, the challenge is to return to the secret place many times during the day and, and, and remember to do that and not just go bazonkers, you know, and forget to just turn yourself inward. Our peace is really like the ocean. It really is. If, if you thought about... <clears throat> Suppose there's a hurricane and there's 20-foot waves on the ocean, uh, on the surface. But if you go down maybe 50 feet, it's as calm and as serene as can be. And that's the way our life is, kind of like on the outside. And if we will turn our hearts to find Jesus on the inside and find rest there, while all that stuff's going on, 
and then come back to the surface and deal with it and go back inside and keep replenishing and have a rhythm like that will be a whole lot more peaceful. And we really will. There's a great book called Experiencing the Depths of Jesus Christ. To my knowledge, it was released in uh, right around uh, the year 1700 by a lady named uh, Jean Guyon. And this book, this book was banned in France and was burned uh, by the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, she actually even went to jail for 14 years because of her writings. But this book called Experiencing the Depths of Jesus Christ, I've had this thing for 35 years or so, and I still, go, I, I still keep going back to it. It is amazing. And by the way, I checked on Amazon, Experiencing the Depths of Jesus Christ, if you remember that, if you're interested. Uh, it, you, I couldn't believe it. I looked it up on Amazon this morning. They said if I ordered it today, they'd have it to me by 2 o'clock. <laughs> I, so I, I couldn't believe it, but that's I, you know that's what it said. It was prime. That's what it said. Dave, you're shaking your head. It's what it's. <laughs> but, but anyway, it's a good book. You, you might consider that. And what this what she does is she really I I, I I've got to wrap up. But what she does, she goes in and teaches you how to reach down, how to really reach down into the depths. In, in this, you know, to maintain this connection with him inside while all the junk's going on outside and how to maintain a, a serene, a serene character. Actually, we want to get to a place while if everybody around us is losing their heads, we can still keep an hour, you know, and that would, that's, that's kind of like the goal. Jesus said this, and you love these words and so do I. He said, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Did I get the wrong verse? Did I say the wrong verse? Okay, well, okay, right. And then, I, you know, I, I, I love the words in, in Isaiah 40, verse 11. The Lord tends his flock like a shepherd. He carries his lambs in his arms. That's us. And he holds them close to his heart. And that's you. And that's me. We're his lambs. When we turn to him and when we come to him and rest. So, I'm just about done. I have one scripture I want to read and I want you to think about this. I want to share with you what the Apostle Peter was inspired to write in his first letter, chapter 5. And beginning with about verse 16. And I'm going to read it to you from an old paraphrase from the late 60s called the Living Bible. Uh, some of you are old. Some of, there's a few of you here that can still remember that. Uh, written and paraphrased by Kenneth Taylor. Wonderful, wonderful work. My dear wife uh, cut her teeth on that Bible. In fact, the cover looks like she cut her teeth on it, actually. <laughs> but, but, but it's taken some wear. But here's what it says. If you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, in his good time, he will lift you up. Let him have all of your worries and cares. He is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Be careful. Watch out for attacks from Satan, your great enemy. He prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion looking for someone to tear apart. Stand firm when he attacks. Trust the Lord. Remembering that other Christians all around the world are going through these sufferings too. 
And after you have suffered a while, our God, who is full of kindness through Christ, will give you his eternal glory. He personally will come and pick you up and set you firmly in place and make you stronger than ever. To him be all power over all things forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Jason.